Aho Shalom Rasafari. Ne Rasia Dinos Tafari Nang. I am Wendem Yadam. And we're in the sixteenth the sixteenth uh weekly Torah portion known as Be Shalach Be Shalach and Belek Eke Belek Eke Gize Belek Eke in the Royal Amharic of the Mets of Kedus of Kedamawi Haile Selassie first Revised Amharic Bible. Now, we're still in the Passover period. This is still connected with last week's portion, and last week's portion is um, was Bo, which means to enter. That's the Hebrew Bo or Gibba. Gibba is the royal Amharic. So Gibba, which means to to enter in, to to enter into, to go into. It can mean to go, but in the idea of going into. Now, that word I didn't note this previously, but some of the um, <clears throat> I would say novice, the new newcomers to the Amharic studies might not know it, but the intermediate grades and the advanced, especially the advanced grades of the Nabab Bait and the Amharic literacy, would recognize that certain words have a double and uh, entendre, like a double kind of a meaning. They may have one meaning which is G-rated, and then another meaning that can be a more, a little more R-rated, or even in some sense depends on the connotation. It can be a little more explicit. Now, that word gibba also has this idea and this sense to it, and Yah willing, we'll try to get into a little bit more of that, but make a note of that word gibba. Now. We're still in this is the this is the um sixteenth Shabbat and Simchat Torah, the sixteenth sabbatical study and reading and feeding within this cycle. And we're in the, the period of study and the period of reading, the Torah portion, the Orit and the Bab reading, uh covers the Passover and the Exodus period. Now not to get into a lot of the historical and some of the speculative arguments, the counter arguments, the reconstructions, and so forth and so on, which is very interesting, which is very interesting. But there's a, a, a specific purpose for us as Rastafari and as Ethiopian Hebrews in, in studying it to, to gain the wisdom of Abba, the wisdom of our Father in and through the Moshiach. Yehoshua, our Black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let us continue with our studies, and we'll say Shalom, since most hopefully this day, um, this is like going into the evening of the Shabbat now, and this is like now we'll be going into Sunday actually. For most, it will be Saturday, Saturday night, but that's another. Teaching another very important aspect is time telling, understanding and recognize what is the proper um, time telling. That the evening is the evening is the beginning, the evening and morning. So now this will be the ending part of the Shabbat. And if we were in community, ones would have come together even after the Shabbat, like even in the state of Israel today. They, they practice this and also have uh, Damara, Damara-like gatherings, you know, and, and celebrations after the end of the Shabbat in, in, a, in a very similar sense of what the biblical would do. They've studied it a lot and have sought to uh, assimilate our ancient way of life and those principles and precepts for a very important reason. Now, um, that being said, this part would actually be in the community also the, the, the first day, Ehud, or the Sunday gathering. In other words, what the preacher or the bishop or what ones would gather together for the first day of the week and would discuss the Torah portion, the Devar Torah, or a, a sermon, a sibkat, 
a teaching on the historical part or perhaps something that's more prophetic or relevant. There's wisdom also contained. When the Holy Spirit now gives illumination, there's extras. And there's a lot of extras in this Torah portion because it's 2012 and everything that's going on. You know, that which is going on around us and also that which is going on in, in many of us as we're going through these um, transformative processes in order to be in conformity with the, with the image of Yeshua and in spirit and in truth. Now, Beshalach, 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 which is the Hebrew for when he let go, when he let let which is interesting because that's exactly what um, um, Musa, Moses, the head of the fraternal order of the Ibrawian, of the Hebrews, because before they were Israelites, they were known as Hebrews or Hebrews. And if you study Hebrew and the etymology and linguistics of that particular word Hebrew, um, you will also find that there's a very Egyptian, there's an Egyptian uh, relevance to that. To much of the Bible, there's an Egyptian context, and there's a lot of um, arguments that the Exodus and the Bible, this fairy tale, so forth and so on, and, and the Israelites were never in bondage or slavery or whatever like that. And I'm sure you've probably heard a lot of these, um, a lot of these arguments. And to a degree, they are correct in the sense that it wasn't like you was told, and it wasn't who you were told. There's been a lot of um, mismaking in modern society in modern times. If you were to ask about the the people of the Bible, most people would believe that they were um, European people or white folks, white people, and that's all part of that mismaking. And in order to keep that farce going for political and a lot of other kind of reasons as well, um, a lot of true data and information that would prove who the Beit Israel were would prove when they were in um, Barnet or a state of um, servitude, uh, a state of not the rulers, but they went from being the rulers or part of the royals of Egypt to being part of the the the, the servant the servant class or the oppressed class. In other words, the Beta Israel previous to the Exodus were were of the royals. And I mean of the royals, they were of what would be called the aristocracy. They were of the middle to upper class, not so much as economically, but social status because of Yosef or some say Yim Ayim Hotep because of Joseph and because of the patriarchs. But now, in the time of Musa, in the time of Moses, something had changed. There's been a lot of changes. There's this whole time of change that is similar, very much so, to the present time that we are in, 2012 as well. There's a lot of changes. Um, and it's not just because of politics. There are a lot of overlapping wheels within wheels, cycles in cycles that are aligning at this present time, 2012, and in this time and so-called, quote, time and space um, dispensation that we're in, just like it was in the time of Musa or Moses, and this is what makes this particular teaching and even the studies very interesting. As some of the videos that we have tried to, and information we've tried to share um, with some of the updates over the past week and the past couple of weeks have been in the effort to 
um, share a little bit of that with one, say, check out this video. These ones talk about, for example, the Passover, the Comet, um, Nibiru, Planet X, so forth and so on, the Mayan calendar, the so-called Colbrin Bible. Are these things real? Are they really just really great hoaxes? Is something going to happen on this particular day, or what's up? Where should we go? What should we do? There's there's a lot of anxiety, um, and this is why we pointed out the scripture of the Moshia, where he said that people would, their hearts would fail them um, because of the expectation of what is to come to pass for those who dwell on the earth in that particular time which we're entering in. This is the beginning of the times that Yeshua HaMoshiach um, prophesied and, and warned his people, our people, us, concerning. So we shouldn't fear those things. And it's through these studies, it's through the prayer and the meditation, the fellowship, and doing good according to what pleases Abba, what pleases our Father, in, in, in the spirit and in the faith of Yeshua HaMoshiach. He is that example for us in spirit and in truth. You understand? And um, there is a lot of, there's so much to say. Let's just try to go through this right here. And then we'll touch on some of the other um, related points that we would like to touch on. A, a basic summary of Beshalach. A basic summary of Beshalach. Um, it means when he let go, when he let go, almost like when he releases, you know, like somebody holding you when he releases. The second word, the first distinctive word in the parasha, the kufu, the portion, it's the 16th weekly Torah portion. In the annual Hebraic, we say Hebraic, they say Jewish. That's also a little a little trick of word, um, etymology versus connotation right there. Um, the annual Hebraic cycle. Make a note of that as well. Many people say, oh, this is the Jewish, 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 Jewish people, right? But if you read the scripture for yourself, even in translation, you'll see clearly that it does not say in, in, the, in the more correct translations, like King James and other, even some of the New Bibles, it says the Israelites. It says Hebrews, actually. The people are identified as Hebrews. And um, this is how we can trace them. You understand? So, so we need to understand that, that um, the, 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 the matrix, there's a matrix in the name right the name the name encloses that which we are mining for and that which we are searching for has been sealed up many times in the words in certain key words and understanding the words in their proper context and in their multi applications words have multi even today we use slang we speak a certain way and no one needs to explain it to you because you're already, you're in society, you know how people speak. But if one were to write it down or put it in a book and hundreds of years in the future, someone is reading it and translating it, imagine they're looking over things like text messages and they're looking over, you know, how people speak today, even how people speak in 2012 is much different how they convey their ideas or how they disconvey or unconvey or don't convey their ideas than in 1912. So in a hundred years, we see how much can be different and yet the same in a hundred years in America. So we must recall that the Beta Israel was in sojourned in Egypt roughly for 430 years, some say 215 years, and there's a debate about that. But this Torah portion right here, this is the fourth one in the book of Exodus. So we're about to square 
square a reality here. This is the fourth reading in the book of Exodus, and it constitutes Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 to Exodus chapter 17, verse 16. Now, we as Hebrews and black Jews in the diaspora and elect Rastafari, we read it in the 16th Sabbath or the Sendet after the Simchat Torah or Fishha or Rit, generally in January or February. So we're in February. In fact, um, Black History, they used to talk about Black History Month, but but every month for us is our Black Hebrew history. Every Sabbath is our Black history, in other words. But anyway, as the Parsha describes this particular portion, Jah's deliverance of the Beta Israel from Egypt. The Hebrews, we as Hebrews, black Jews, also read part of this Parsha. Now, part of this portion is read, Exodus, namely Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 to Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, as the initial Orit Nebab Torah reading for the seventh Sebatenyau and the seventh day of Fasika. So part of this particular portion here, which is the 16th weekly Torah portion, is also read as the initial or the first Orit Nebab for the seventh day of Fasika. Now, we as Hebrews also, and Jews as well, also read part of this portion or the Parsha about Amalek, about Exodus uh, 17 verses 8 to 16 on Purim. Now Purim is coming up soon, I think in, in March, if the Torah portion reading, I think in here, in this document we actually give some of the dates for this 2012 year. So you can download this right here, in this particular document right here, all right? Um, Rastafari, Hebraic, Judaic, uh, the year, right? Um, now, Purim is coming up. Purim, it, it commemorates the deliverance of um, the, the Persian, the Persian, Ethiopian, Hebrews or Jews, the black Jews. I say black because we have to re-identify our people in, in history in order to really re-identify ourselves in reality. So this Purim is coming up. Now, I don't always want to get off point, but since this is 2012 and it's present time, I just want to share this with you. You know, you've been hearing talk about wars and rumors of wars and the whole thing with Iran and nuclear, such and such and such. It's interesting because if you observe that certain times when certain conflicts arise, notice the, the correspondence with certain Jewish or Hebrew holidays or holy days. Now, it's, it's interesting why that's done, but Purim, you understand, is coming up soon. So just watch and pray. You understand, as we hear these um, about wars and rumors of wars, but a part of this parasha that concerns Amalek, because Amalek was an enemy of Israel and had done some wicked things to the original Beta Israel, the black Jews or the black Hebrews. And um, part of this portion, he, had a, he has a descendant called Haman, but part of this Torah portion, chapter 17, verses 8 to 16, on Purim, this commemorates the story of Astir or Esther. Notice the connection with Ishtar, that particular name. Her name was actually um, Hadasha. Hadasha was a Hebrew name, but she adopted the name Astir, which is an Astir, like an asterisk, means a star. So the name means a star as well. So just that, that connection too, and you know, with Exodus, with this particular time, and then in another direction, we get the so-called Easter among the Gentile 
um, European white Christians in Europe, as you go more to the north, we get this other tradition, which kind of reinvents some of these elemental ideas, such as the name of Esther, Astir, Star, Ishtar, and then you have Easter, and this is right around the Passover time, which is Old Testament, you could say Old Testament Lord's Supper, in other words. But the Hebrew people had victory over Haman's plot and plan. Haman, an enemy of the black Hebrews, um, and interesting, a lot of this took place in Persia, which today is modern-day Iran. This is why a lot of this news concerning um, the Middle East and concerning Iran and Israel and, and whether they're going to get bombed or whether they're going to go to war, wars and rumors of wars, is very, very interesting. It's very interesting. There's a connection. Now, all this concerning Purim, Esther, Haman is contained in the book of, of, of Esther, Esther chapter 1, verse 1 to Esther chapter 10, verse 3. Now, Esther chapter 3, verse 1 identifies Haman as an Agagite. And if you recall last year around this time, we had put forward certain prophetic declarations that when we interpret the elementals vis-a-vis -vis us and vis-a-vis -vis the Haman type that Gaddafi was a type of Haman and we sought to make that very much more clear. Well, we know what happened to Gaddafi as well. Interestingly enough, all kind of connected with this divine time. In other words, if the word is declared with, with, with true intent and spirit, and it is acceptable to heaven, and whatever you seal up on earth, you seal up in heaven. So, consequently and vis-a-vis, -vis, the other Jews, the European Jews, perhaps are also looking at charting a, a, a divine timeline to deal with this Iran thing. And it could be, I think, I, basically, I think that they're going to, understanding overstanding what we overstand. I think they're going to perhaps do it, if not at Purim, if not between now and Purim, then between Purim and, and Fasica. Definitely before the so-called presidential election, something most likely will happen. So, so we're looking at certain divine timelines and certain groups of people who are in tune with certain spiritual and mystical currents of forces while most folks are just in tune with, um, you know, the bills and society. They're, they're on the grid, in other words, in a, different, in a different way. But anyway, Esther chapter 3, verse 1, identifies Haman as an Agagite, and thus a descendant of Amalek. Now, Numbers 24 and 7 identifies the Agagites, who we identify from the Egyptian as a pep, a pepper, or a pothis. So the Agagites have a link with the the Apepa, the Apepa Hyksos, Hikshos, Hekshaus people, a combination of Edomites, Esauites, uh, we'll call them certain re rejects who the Israelites were not to blend in with, that Esau, who was the brother of Yaiko, he mixed his bloodline in with these other Canaanitish tribes and other tribes. And when we speak about Amalek and the Agagites and the Pepper, we have to, and the Hyksos or the Hekshaus too, we have to remember we're speaking about a motley group of folks, folks who are, today they will call them mutts in a certain sense. Um, mixed with a, a lot of different sort of people. This is not against people, but this is speaking about the confederacy against the Beta Israel and the confederacy against God's people. Now, there's a Midrash that tells that between King Agag or King Apepa, Apophis, 
Apophis' capture, he was captured by Saul, Saul the first king of Israel, and his killing by Samuel, that the, that the prophet Sam, Samuel killed a pepper, which is very, very interesting, or killed a gog, but a gog is a pepper. Now, when we put that in its proper Afro-Shemitic context, the story even takes on some mystical, mythical, metaphysical, and a deeper historical contextuality there. But now, Agag fathered a child. Agag had fathered a child from whom Haman is said to be in turn descended. So Haman, and this is very interesting that we have this here. You, you can go to a few are able to search some of the Jewish literature, the Seder Eliyahu Rabbah, chapter 20, from the Targum Sheni, um, which is the Targum Sheni to, to Esther, chapter 4, verse 13, that what you have is very similar to the Kibra, the Kibra Nagasht, or, or, or the, the Kibra Nagas, as people would say. But the Kibra, the Kibra Nagasht also speaks about that. If you recall, there's a chapter where it talks about... Um, how Samson had a child, and the king of the Philistines, who died when Samson brought down the house, literally brought down the house, how their this war continued between these seed lines even afterwards. So the queen of Sheba and her only son Menelik also is, that's what we call it, the Ethiopic um, um, the Ethiopic uh, Talmud to say that it's a Timherit, as we would say, a teaching that goes into additional in details and then helps to explain some of these other areas of Scripture where you find something mentioned in Scripture and you're like, uh, I want to get a little bit more on that. It's probably contained in another document or other information that was known to the people, but in modern times a lot of these things have been fragmented and um, th that's why they're not studied together. When we study the Kibra Neges together with the Bible it helps to highlight and add the fullness to the picture but people reject the Kibra Neges because basically racism, I mean, or ignorance, ignorance or racism. Most folks are ignorant so they listen to racist people who might be professors or write books, so forth and so on, who basically dismiss it not on its merit or lack thereof, but because it is a exclusive Ethiopic document that gives accurate testimony to the superiority of the Ethiopian claims and black African claims over so-called Gentile or European claims. And this is why many of the European scholarship, you know, have written dismissively um, concerning it. But if you study it for yourself, it is on the level and even on a higher level than a lot of the so-called Jewish um, extra-biblical literature, which is looked at very highly by um, folks you know, by these people. But let's just go through this. Now, the Parsha is notable, right? This portion is notable because there's some songs here. There's some songs. There's a song of the sea, which is traditionally chanted using a different melody and is written by the scribe using a distinctive, uh, what they call a brick-like pattern in the, the Torah scroll. Now, the Shabbat or the Senbet the Sabbath, when it is read, is known as the Shabbat Shera or Shabo Shera, and some communities have various customs for this day, including feeding birds and reciting the song of the sea out loud in the regular prayer service. Now, the summary, there's, there's five main parts of this. And there's, there's, there's five main chapters right here. The, the first part is the parting of the red, of the sea of reeds, or the Yam Suf, the bitter water turning sweet, 
manna in the wilderness, water from a stone, and lastly but not leastly, Amalek's attack, Amalek's cowardly and sneak attack, killing Beta Israel um, children, women, and, and old people who were at the rear, who, who journeyed at the rear. The armies went forward in the front of the camp, and the women and the children and the older folks were at the rear. And this is where Amalek um, attacked and lynched and slew and killed many of our people. And um, there was a prophecy and a word that there will be continual warfare between Israel and Amalek from generation to generation. So Amalek, for us, as Rastafari, Lemisale, for example, would be like the crazy ball head. Like the war between Rastafari and the ball heads ain't over. So the war between Beta Israel and Amalek ain't over. It's from generation to generation. And that kind of links once again to one of the first um, the first mention of this war among different spirits or seed types. And we have that between both Cain and Abel on, 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 on one level of it. And the Kibbutz and Nagesh also explains the background that it was Satan who threw his enmity. It was Satan that had enmity um, to Adam, to Ha-Adam, to, to the man that was formed in the image and after likeness of the true and living God, or we could say to the original primordial black man that ha Shaitan had enmity, and he cast that enmity within Kayan, or the red-eyed envious Cain. And this is where we get this, this warfare. But then it was also mentioned between the serpent, the serpent people, the reptilian people, and the original black man. There's also a war that goes on there as well. And we get that even before Cain and Abel um, concerning the Ganetta Aiden and um, what was spoken to um, the, the, the serpent, your seed and, and the seed of the woman shall have, shall, shall, shall have warfare, have enmity. You understand? Enmity. Though you bite man's heels, that means stopping the black man's progress. When the black man gets his divine mind and alignment right, he will crush the reptilian's head. And this is why Haile Selassie first made that mention in the Independence Day speech where he spoke about Caduce Georgis and, and how the serpent had rose up. I mean, it almost sounds, when you read it and hear it, it sounds mythological on a level. But when you put it in the context of what actually was occurring to blameless Ethiopia, to Ethiopia at that time, defenseless, you can say Ethiopia in a sense that it doesn't have war, weapons of warfare and weapons of mass destruction to even protect herself. So Ethiopia experienced that satanic and serpent-like, dragon-like attack. And this is very interesting because if you ask yourself, well, if you take His Majesty's um, May 5th, 1941 speech, and you look at it just as a speech a thousand years from now with no other information. You'll say, oh, he's talking about St. George. He's talking about a dragon. The dragon is raising its head again. He's speaking. This is, this is mythology, people would think. But if you put the historical elements, the more facts that you can put to bear, you can recognize it's only mythology to those who don't understand the deeper and the interdimensional level of the spiritual warfare. So it seems as though when one talks about serpents and dragons, you know, people who are blind to the spiritual world, if they can't see it, they say it doesn't exist. But that's just my commentary on that right there. So 
when Pharaoh, Pharaoh, and we like to look at this in the duality, both Pharaoh would symbolize for Martin, the, the Martin spiritual Egyptian um, 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 correspondence of it would be the federal government for the niggas that went down to Egypt to get a check that was marked insufficient funds, as well as the individual who was speaking for Pharaoh and Pharaoh, though, so Pharaoh is not just a name of one person. Pharaoh is a whole establishment, but also the person who speaks for the establishment. So that's what I mean. Words have this duality, and we need to recognize that duality. The ancients understood that. This is why it, it may seem like the Bible is a fairy tale. That's only to ones who are reading at a kindergarten level. That's where it seems like a fairy tale to those who are able to read at a high school or a university or universal level. Then they're able to see the deeper element and the real world application. So when Pharaoh let the Beta Israel go, when he basically gave up trying to hold, hold black people back, in other words, Jah led the people round about by the way of the Yam Suf, which is an interesting portion, Exodus 13, which is the beginning of the reading, Exodus 13 and 17 to 18. Uh, Musa, Moshe, he took the bones of Yosef with them in Exodus 13 and 19. John went before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night in Exodus 13 and 21. Now, let's deal with something right here for a moment. Let's get the scripture out. Um, as you can see, we still have some of the information from our former posting where we was doing Fasica, Pesach, because we're not quite done with this, because, see, Fasica, Pesach, is coming up, and it's interesting that we have this opportunity to become familiar with some of the elements. It's one of the most important. It's, it's the most important holiday um, of the of the Hebrews and and even of Jews or those into Judaism of Christians who who know what Christ is about and what he fulfilled. Fasica or Pesach is also the most important holy day or holiday, which is only probably trumped by the birth or the incarnation of the Moshiach, the incarnation of Christ. But it's the most important holiday for ancient Christians because this is where we have the communion, the Lord's Supper, the so-called Eucharist, so forth and so on. It all derives from this story all derives from this particular template. Now, we had touched on in this, we touched on Exodus chapter chapter 12 in a couple of videos um, dealing with what well, we had ended off with this right here, which is still on the board. Um, yet the, the, the reading actually also included chapter 13. Now, we, we would begin this from 13 and 17, and it came to pass when uh, Pharaoh had let the people go, that God, Elohim, led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines. Although that near, although that was near, for Jah said, for Elohim said, least or lest peradventure the people repent, have a change of mind, start to think different when they see war, and they return to Egypt. Now let's just, let's pause right there. Let's just understand and understand this first verse of the 16th sabbatical reading 
or, or the Torah portion. It says, And it came to pass when Pharaoh, Pharaoh had let the people go, Beshalach, Belek Egizeh, that Egiziavi her Lotusapat, that that Elohim led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines. So they could have gone one way, which was nearer, which was was was, was closer at hand. But instead, John took them the longer route or the more um, circuitous route, and not the easy way. But hear this. It says, although that way, although although that was near, for God said, lest peradventure the people, and, and we have to recognize what people are we talking about. We're talking about people like ourselves. You understand? We're talking about black folks. I mean, I, I know some people may say, oh, it's a Jewish people. You won't find Jew one time in, in, in all of Exodus. So just get off of that. You understand? Basically. Um, you won't. Plain and simple. Let's cut out the lies. You know, deception. This is this is our story. This is our divine heritage. But he says, for peradventure, let's peradventure the people repent, which means not repent, turn to God, but actually turn away from Jah. You understand? So see how that can work. When they see war and they return to Egypt. So the people would have had a change of heart if they had seen war, and they would have returned to Egypt. This is interesting. And when I, when, when I was reading over this, you know, in preparation um, for this teaching, saying, all right, Holy Spirit, guide me. What, what about this is important? I know just generally the basics, but is there anything that, that we need to see, that we need to know? And this part just 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 burst out like like a like a sunrise in a sense at me, and the rays just just came forward into I and I I, and I began to recognize this is why we hear so much about war nowadays. Think about it. Think about it. At a time because if some of y'all might be um um old enough, uh, you know, I'm not saying pejoratively, but, you know, some of you might remember back in the, in, the, in the late 80s, early 90s, black consciousness, so forth and so on, rah, 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 Kente cloth, all of that. Blacks were talking about Africa, global, international, all that, so forth and so on. It was like, it was like finally, you know, repatriation was just around the corner. Although some individuals, similar to how the returned captives came from exile in Babylon, had returned to Jerusalem or had returned to Ethiopia or Shashemeni, the majority of the people had not. And you remember, if you if you recall, it was what was it, ninety one, when we had the Gulf War and had a black man. Colin Powell uh, as the face of that, Bush, of course, senior at his side. And, and once again, every time the movement comes to the head when pressures and, and consciousness is such that there is a possibility of people escaping from the bird cage, so to speak, there's these wars that come up. There's these wars or terrorism. Isn't that interesting? And what John says right here is that if the people, if the people see war, if they see there's a conflict going on there, they're not going to engage and overcome. They're going to run back to Egypt. Remember in the 60s, it was the same thing. In the 60s, and what did King and the rest of the civil rights so-called um, misleaders, and they were misleaders coming from the church. That's, that's what they were. I know this is not a message that a lot of folks will just get turned off to that, but if you're turned off to the truth, then you haven't developed the love of the truth, and that's your fate. You're not I and I fate, but if we are hypocrites like, like those who will get turned off, 
to the fact that King and the rest of them were misleaders from, from God's perspective. They were not speaking what they should have spoken to this people. This is why this people is in this shit that we see today. 70,000 black people over a period of how many years it was uh, have been murdered and killed by black folks. We, we've been hearing of police shootings. Uh, one young brother walked into his house, had police break in there, and he got shot, they say, for trying to flush some marijuana, allegedly, down the toilet. Got shot in his chest. They bust into the bathroom. Who knows if he was using the bathroom? I mean, it's just a disgusting story. It's a real disgusting thing. And still, folks will suffer all of that in this spiritual Egypt instead of preparing their hearts and minds and coming out. Don't they see how big Jah has made the world or the earth? Don't they know Africa, how big Africa is? You know what I mean? Don't they know that other folks are investing, their bosses, the people they work for are trying to invest in Africa and get a little house and cottage there so they can rent it out to you, a timeshare or something like that? Anyway, it's just interesting right here that we find that Yahweh says at the very beginning of this, this, this parasha, uh, Beshalach, Belek Ek Gizeh, says that instead of leading him the way that was nearer, and when you look at the map, and maybe we'll do this in another portion to take out some of the maps we have so we can show you the way that was nearer, that, that, that he said, no, 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 we're not going to go that way. We're going to go this other way. Because if they saw war, they would return, become like weak hearts for the easier life in Egypt. And we're going to get into some more of that. We're going to find those kind of... Um, buyer's remorse, you know, like, you know, they bought the exodus, but then later on they're feeling, you know, feeling bad about it and wish they were back in Egypt getting Egyptian welfare. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness. Jah led them through the wilderness. He could have taken them the short route, taken them the highway, but, but, but they, they, they could not go on the king's highway because they still were, they still were niggers. You know, they still were niggers. They still were, were rude and coarse and ill-formed to God's purpose. They still were in their selfish selves. They still were thinking of me and I instead of we. So they had to go through the wilderness experience. So God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. That's interesting right there, too, that the children of Beit Israel, when they went out, they, they, they didn't go out empty-handed, but they went out harnessed. That means they went out armed. You know, they went out armed. You know, they went out ready to protect and defend themselves. They went out like fighters, not like punks. They didn't leave there, you know, like a bunch of scaredy cats. You know, that's, I, I say that because instead of us preparing a lot of folks are waiting to the last, the very last minute, you understand, until they see the ivory tower of Babylon fall, and then they say, okay, I guess I'll, I guess I'll go to Africa. It will be too late then. I mean, it's kind of obvious that some of those things, now is the time to begin to think about it and to decide and make up your mind and then to prepare. Get informed and involved and, and invest in your future and the future of your children, your family, and your other loved ones who are one with you. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God Elohim, Ha Elohim, Buruku, will surely visit you. And ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. Now, this is a little interesting note in Exodus uh, 13 and 19, that Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. So probably the, it was mummified, so forth and so on, according to 
you know, the custom of the day. For he had straightly sworn the children of Israel. Who? Joseph. Joseph had, and now we have to remember the time span on this, that in Joseph's day, they were comfortably middle class. The Israelites were comfortably middle class, and Joseph, you know, he, he was up there in, in, in the sense of, you know, he was like, um, I guess, on a level of Obama on, on a certain level. I'm not saying Obama's a Joseph, don't get it twisted, but he was on that sort of level as far as, you know, uh, a nigga from Kenya or Hawaii or Indonesia, wherever he come from, <laughs> you know, getting to that point, that's, that's, you know, that's doing pretty good for yourself in a lifetime. And just to give you a comparison so you can understand the context of who Joseph was and how far Joseph had, had gotten. Now, we know that Joseph, Yosef, Iusif, was a prophet. In other words, he had the mystical gift. He also, no doubt, was an astrologer. You know, uh, he was into astrology, astronomy. People try to mince, mince words with that. But he understood the heavens. He understood the celestial calendar and the celestial calculation. And here is what is key about this whole thing that actually connects with this 2012 Planet X, Nibiru, what else they call it? They call it brown dwarf star. They got a bunch of elanine and these other kind of names they have. Because um, Joseph, he makes the children of Israel, he puts them under oath, under like a Sheba, under a firm type of vow, commitment, an oath, an agreement, a solemn and a sacred agreement. Like we used to say one time, black folks used to say, your word is born, word is born, word is, some say word is born, but really word is bond. Like one's word was their bond. You know, that if one said yes, they said yes. It wasn't like later on you say, didn't you say yes? Oh, no, I didn't say yes. You know, people, no. You know, if you gave your word, word was, was honored more than in this end time, um, last day of the Gentile times generation. But Joseph, he knew something. And we want to touch on what did Joseph know. Because Joseph said that God will surely visit you. That God will surely... Did Joseph know about the stars and the heavens and... and and the orbits, obviously he did because you remember what got him in trouble with his brothers? What had got Joseph in trouble with his brothers because he said that the 11 stars and the sun and the moon are going to bow down to me. And and the family was like, the you know, mama, papa, you know, was like Jacob and, and all the siblings were, you know, they were like, do you mean you, your mother and me? And and, 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 and and your brothers are going to bow down to you. And, and that was one of the reasons why some of the brothers, yeah, his own brothers, wanted to kill him. They thought, like, he is who you think he is. Who you think you are, nigga? You understand? That's how they felt about Joseph, little old Joseph. But as time would tell, Joseph was correct. You understand? So Joseph had what they call that, spiritual sight or int intuition, some call it, but we know that he was in tune with the true and living God, with the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, Abba Kaddus. He was in tune with our Heavenly Father, and our Heavenly Father revealed to him certain things and guided him, you understand, in his illuminations. And therefore, he was able to interpret dreams. He was able to be prophetic. He had that prophetic insight. So now when Joseph is about to give up this um, fleshy life, you know, give up the carbon, the organic structure, the body, he makes his brothers and, 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 and the generation swear that, you know, like you're going to, you know, take my bones with you because God is surely going to do what? Visit. Now, 
what a strange thing. I mean, we say God is with us, right? You know, that's that's how people would say, well, God is God is with us. God is in me. God is closer than my juggler's hand, right? But what did that mean? Did they think the same thing in those times? Obviously, they thought that God was with them. Or what? What does it mean that God will visit you? What a strange, you know, like in in Christianity, most folks who accept it, well, we know what it means. What does it mean? They don't know what it means. The churches. We say that this has a lot to do with something that we wanted to introduce from before, but everything in its right time, in its right timing here, as you recall, this is his pie. And we might keep this up here for a moment and just take off some of this. Remember we made the connection with pie and the 3.14 revelation, the amen, the golden mean ratio. So what we're going to do is just keep that portion up there. And now we're in... We're not in we're not in in twelve, but it's still concerning Fasica. This is still about Passover, and I'm gonna explain what I mean. That we're now in thirteen. Now Exodus thirteen, right? And this is the sixteenth. This will be the R S S number sixteen. And um let's give the Hebrew here Beth Shalak. Right, well, transcription, you know, um, Beshalak. So we're in Beshalak, the sin to go, the Lekeka Gizeh Bamarinya. Now, there's something known as the Pass Over Comet. Right? And we say comet loosely. Loosely. Some say. It's really a planet. They say planet X. You know, they say it's really, the Sumerians call it Nibiru. Others say um, it's it's Elamine, you know, from the Leo constellation. Kind of interesting from the Leo constellation, right? Um, some of us can even say, well, if it's Passover comet uh, and this is the time, why don't we call it New Jerusalem. It, it might be New Jerusalem coming. It could be a whole, uh, like a Death Star. For Babylon, it is the Death Star. See, this is why they did that movie, the Star Wars thing. For Babylon, this is like the Death Star. You understand? Because it is called, biblically speaking, you remember what it was called, biblically speaking? It, it is called the Destroyer. Right? The Destroyer. Now, it's interesting, this cycle of sevens that we have, too, the cycle of sevens. You remember in, in the book of, a book of Genesis, there were the, the seven cows or the seven Hathors. Remember, it's Moses that, that from the beginning of his book, he introduced creation in seven distinct periods. Now, what's interesting is that when we go from the book of Genesis, right, from Genesis and keep Shabbat and Sabbath in mind because the Sabbath now is that rest before the 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 recommencement of a cycle. So we have this sevens. We have this period of sevens that we need to keep in mind. Now, when Joseph told his people that God you understand, will visit you. Now, you notice something when you read about the whole Passover, the Passover angel, some, some call this the destroyer. Let me just write this here. Some say it was an angel, right? It's an angel. Now, if you just read one verse out of context, you might get a, a kind of a twisted idea. You might think the destroyer is, is, is how could... You, how can you connect God to this? But if you read it in context, I forget the exact um, the, the exact scripture where it actually mentions that 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 God would He directs this angel. This angel is directed. You know what I'm saying? Well, He don't call it. It's not called exactly an angel, but it's called the destroyer. Now, there's something known as the Passover comet. 
Now, one name, um, Velikovsky, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Velikovsky. He did some reconstruction of ancient Egypt, some very, very good, good work that we want to um, give you as a reference. Um, one is a book called Moses in 12th Dynasty or Dynasty Literature. Um, in 12th, yeah, 12th Dynasty, Moses in 12th Dynasty Literature. If you Google it, you'll get the, the more precise or exact name. And some free pages out there. Plus, there's a book, I think, he, the, the person who did the article on. And, and basically, it's a reconstruction of the events in Egypt, taking into context that a lot of Egyptian literature has, chronologically speaking, been recently discovered. And what ones who have been studying this Egyptian literature have been noticing is that some of the other aspects, you know, like when you read in the Bible, for example, we read in this portion right here, it doesn't go into anything more. It just gives that highlight. Even the Bible talks about other books. If you want to know more about it, go to this book or that book. There's a couple of areas in the Bible that explains it like that. Because it's like what we, how we communicate today, things you already know about. I don't have to go into much detail if I'm going to continue or add something new to it because you already know about that. All I need to do is to make a little reference. And sometimes I don't have to say go to such and such a book because everybody knows it's in that particular book. You see, now the naysayers who want to say that the Bible and the scriptures, the fairy tale, and, and there was no Israel, and Israel was never in Egypt, and all this other nonsense. If you want to say the white Jews were never in ancient Egypt, okay, that then we can agree with you. We can start a discussion on that. Man, the white Jews have started discussions on that as well, because they just want to know, well, what happened? Because they're really interested in the story. Well, Others still continue to play the game of, of lying to themselves, but those who have repented out of that that false that that false mentality should be a little more interested in what does this really say, and are we aligning ourselves to a Passover comment 2012? You understand? Is is, is this what's going on with this Elamine and the Biru? Because what we've learned, as, as we're trying to share this, is that Passover is the end. Fasika Pesach was the end of a seven of a cycle of seven. There was a cycle of seven. It it begins in a sense, or it's, it's initiated by Joseph's vision. Joseph is the visionary in the family. He's like, he's the, he was a real dreamer, in a sense, in the sense that he didn't make up dreams, but he, he, he got visions in his dream and was able to interpret the dreams of others accurately. Accurately. He didn't pretend that he was no psychic or whatnot like that. He was truly a spiritual, a spiritual being this Joseph, or some might call him Ayimhotep or Yimhotep. Now, the Passover Comet 2012, this destroyer angel, is all connected with the Fasika and Pesach. Because Pesach means to pass over, Malef, Alefe, Halefe, to pass over. That when they had the blood, on the particular points of the doorway, the gateway, right? When the gateway was properly sealed, the effects of this Passover comment would not touch those who were sealed within. So we see the connection here between the pie, 316, and the amen. They were what hidden within. They were hidden within. Now, this particular archway and doorway, is, it's very, this particular shape is very, is very old. That means it was known to ancient people, but interpreted 
in, in various ways and in various different cultures, mythologies, oh, you know, their, their way of telling a story. Basically, we would say their mythologies. Not to speak derisive, you know, people say, oh, it's just a myth. We could say um, the American dream is a myth. You know what I mean? Basically, some might agree, some might disagree. He who feels it knows it. But the Passover comment is a very interesting connection, and we find that what Joseph says here is really is really very interesting because Joseph says that God will visit you. Now, from some of our research, what we found is that ones have speculated that Moses, and this agrees now with what we have also discovered in the Ethiopic and, and from the teachings, that Moses was able to accurately calculate, you understand, calculate the the different threads of, of of the story and put it together where he had a good comprehension or a perfect understanding of what was what regarding these heavenly signs and what was going on on earth and therefore had a good understanding of the timing. Now, the key link with Moses is his Median or Ethiopian in-laws. This is the key link. Because when Moses is accused of murdering the, quote, Egyptian, and we don't know, obviously this Egyptian was somebody important. It wasn't just a commoner, you understand? Because Moses himself was a royal, so he must have murdered a royal or killed a royal. He flees. Where does he flee to? He flees to uh, Medea, Median, the, the Median, which was a, a part of, we can say greater Ethiopia. If we look at these people as Ethiopian people, it's obvious that in the Bible, um, Moses' um, wife is called an Ethiopian, even though her father is called a Median, and she's called a Medianite, but they're Ethiopians. And they are also Afro-Shemitic. In other words, they are Shemites. How do we know this? Because uh, Keturah was Abraham's third wife, and he had about six sons. And of these sons, we have even Sheba or Saba or Sheba and other tribes and peoples that are known as Ethiopians or we can just say black folks or Afro-Shemites, Africans who are Shemites. So the key connection now is his Medeanite in-laws, because remember, Moses spends about the next 40 years in um, m m um, the land of the Medeanites, and also, according to Talmud and other, uh, other ancient sources, he was a general of the Ethiopians, you know. Some say he married the uh, Ethiopian um, king or ruler's daughter. He commanded um, Ethiopian armies from the south against um, the north, e Egypt speaking generally, so forth and so on. But what's more interesting is, is the priestcraft. In other words, the priestcraft, the, the priests of the Medeanites, Jethro, which is coming up next week, actually, who has about three or four names, uh, 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 Ruel and, and Hobab, he's also called, was his instructor. You understand? Remember, Moses didn't talk to any burning bush, so forth and so on, until he was in the wilderness and he was with the Medeanites. And remember, it was the Medeanites who also had had um, um, taken Joseph to Egypt. Remember, they were called Ishmaelites, or some call them loosely Ishmaelites, but remember, the Ishmaelites were the black Arabs. In other words, if you want to see who the Ishmaelites, the real Ishmaelites are today, look at the Sudanese, look at the Somalians. You understand? If you want to see some of the mixed people, then you look at some of the Arabs today. But if you want to look at some of the pure 
pure blood, you will look at the, the, the Sudanese. You will look at the Somalians. Those are the type of, quote, Medeanites. Now, the Medeanites were Sab Sabians. They were Sabians. Now, pejoratively, they say the Sabians were, were um, star worshipers, stargazers, star worshipers, pejoratively in a negative sense. However, at their height, they understood the heavens. They understood astronomy. They understood the procession, the movement of the heavens, and were able to calculate things far superior to the Egyptians. Now, most folks would think the Egyptians were the best because of Dendera. Well, Dendera, true, is much better than anything we have coming out of Europe, and the Europeans have learned and, and been um, aided greatly in their understanding of the heavens by the Dendera, you know, the Dendera um, art and facts, so forth and so on. But let us re recall that the priests, the ancient priests of the, of the Kamites were Ethiopians. That the priest class, the ancient, so from the south, so we have a south-north dynamic going on. So Moses, being more in the northern portion, he goes to the east, and then he goes further to the south, and is said to spend time in the heartland, in Ethiopia. And all this time, remember, he is around those who understand the higher spiritual art. In other words, he was around the scientists, you know, the you could say the top-notch scientists, the people who, who knew about the, the black projects of the old.